Welcome back to Beyond Well. I'm Sheila Hamilton, and I think you probably all know by now that this is a program for people who want to learn more about our interior lives. And we have consistently thanked our partners, Active Recovery TMS. Dr. Preetham Raj has been with us in lockstep in trying to bring better habits and better mechanics to people's lives. And today we're going to talk about the new round of antidepressants and other means for treating treatment-resistant depression. Hello, Dr. Raj. It's so good to see you. Sheila, great to be with you again. I think it's actually a really exciting time for people who are suffering from depression. Would you agree? Absolutely. It's an innovative time to be uh, in this area of medicine. So let's talk a little bit about what has changed. We have had traditional antidepressants for a long time. Was there any way in which traditional antidepressants sort of fell short for the people using them? Well, the biggest challenge that we have in this day and age, Sheila, is actually adherence to medications. We know that that's a big challenge. Uh, we know that probably less than 20% of people actually take medicines as prescribed. And I'm not even just talking about uh, psychiatric medications. I'm talking about medications at large. Just think about antibiotic use. You know, people take, you know, antibiotics, take them for a little bit and then they feel better and then stop. You know, it's the same thing with cardiac meds. Somebody's had a heart event, they take their heart meds for a little bit and then they fall off. Even in transplant patients, Sheila, we see this happen where people just stop taking their meds. So in the depression world, people stop taking their meds when they start feeling better. And that's a challenge. We know that depression itself is a relapsing, remitting illness that kind of comes and goes. And so when you start feeling better, you stop taking your meds. And that is one of the biggest challenges that we face in this area. Wow, that's so interesting. Does it make a person's depression worse if they've had a habit of doing that, Dr. Raj? A little bit. So I would say, so the classic example is someone who say a medicine like sertraline has been helpful. Zoloft is its other name. So sertraline was helpful at 150 milligrams. The patient then stops it say after three months, they start feeling better and they stop it. There's no guarantee, Sheila, that going back to 150 milligrams of sertraline is going to control those symptoms. Wow. The symptoms that emerge after that could be resistant to that 150 and you could require more medicine. So that's what we worry about with this stop and start phenomenon that we see with antidepressant therapy. Wow. That's really interesting. I've never heard anybody talk about that before. So I appreciate you bringing that up. I'm wondering sure. if there has been an increase in consumer demand for an antidepressant that was a little bit faster acting that could help a person who was really suffering more immediately. Indeed. We in the United States, we're used to getting things done right away, right? We hate to wait as a society. We eat fast food. We want fast entertainment. We want bite-sized everything, right? And so waiting the traditional four to six weeks, Sheila, is tough. And that makes it more difficult for the adherence to medication. Um, if you're not seeing any changes four weeks later and, and we're telling them to be patient, maybe it'll kick in in weeks five and six. That's a tough thing sometimes. So absolutely, the interest is medications that can work fast and bring quick relief, especially when we're talking about more difficult areas of depression like major depression with suicidal ideation, for example. We don't want to wait weeks or even days. We would love to treat that within hours. So some of the newer antidepressants have promised that. Just talk about some of the these newer type of antidepressants that have been approved by the FDA. Certainly. So the FDA approved version of ketamine is the medication molecule called S-ketamine. It's one of the enantiomers of ketamine uh, that people may know as an anesthetic agent that's gotten a lot of press. S-ketamine, the nasal delivery version of ketamine is FDA cleared. Mm -hmm. Now, just because I say it's FDA cleared doesn't mean it's easy to get. It's still a challenge for us to get it covered by insurance companies because it's expensive and does require monitoring. So everybody thinks, oh, I can just take this at home. Not so fast. The thing with S-ketamine that we must know, Sheila, is that it does require 
two hours of monitoring in the office. So it's outpatient. It's not inpatient, but outpatient monitoring for two hours to actually monitor blood pressure is required with this medication. And then when we're done with treatment, it's a little different than transcranial magnetic stimulation where someone can just get in their car and drive away mm -hmm. with esketamine we can't have them drive because it can impair their focus and attention uh, because it is a medicine that affects the central nervous system in a different way. It can lead to sedation and monitoring is required as well as safe passage home. So yeah. usually we want somebody to drive them home and no driving within those 24 hours. So I was reading about how esketamine works on low levels of brain derived neurotropic factor. So I mm -hmm. want to know more about how it restores this brain derived neurotropic factor and what does it do to help a patient feel better? Yeah. So BDNF that you just mentioned is a very interesting area. It goes along with the teeter totter in the brain between glutamate and GABA. GABA and glutamate is like a teeter totter of excitatory on the glutamate side and inhibitory on the GABA side. And BDNF, brain derived neurotrophic factor, is kind of linked with glutamate. So in esketamine's case, esketamine is a NMDA receptor antagonist. Okay. What that simply means is we think, and, and that's a big, we think there are complicated medical journals that I even struggle with in, in, in trying to interpret are the levels of glutamate going up, oh. down, staying the same. Does it even correlate with depression markers? A lot of it's unknown, Sheila, but we think that with the NMDA receptor antagonism, it, elevates in some areas the glutamate and because that elevates the bdnf also elevates and leads to an antidepressant effect wow that, that it's amazing to me because i first heard about ketamine as a party drug i heard about the kids in the <laughs> vitamin club. k right Sheila? exactly yeah. and so or special k i guess it was yeah. special k <laughs> and so what was the process that allowed people to, to begin to see like, oh, maybe this would have some beneficial effects for people who are really suffering, not just for kids who want to get high and dance? Well, the simplistic way of thinking about it, a party drug, nobody wants to take things that don't make people feel good or better, right? And so um, if it was enhancing the party effect or enhancing mood, then naturally it became a reason to study it in this space. Wow. Same thing we're seeing with psilocybin, right? Uh, the psilocybin journey has been an interesting one used as a, a party drug, um, you know, earlier on in, in decades past, and now getting more legitimate science looking at it and saying, hey, is psilocybin, you know, the next thing that that enhances mood like ketamine? Dr. Raj, one of the things that has always perplexed me about this is it would stand to reason that if you increase a lot of those chemicals in your brain, when you stop it, you're going to kind of have a crash and or I don't know, are you? Do people crash after they've had a treatment with ketamine? Yeah, that's always the concern because we're talking about short acting yes. medications, right? The short acting drugs that um, maybe have an impact right away in hours, but then is there an offset? Yeah, that that is the, the uh, entire concern. But with this, I think what is happening is just like we talk about neuromodulation from transcranial magnetic stimulation. I think there is modulation happening in the brain that changes how we use neurotransmitters and proteins and everything of, of that sort that shifts with time. And, yeah. and that is, that's why the induction phase, for example, with esketamine is eight weeks. We hope within eight weeks that we start to see more consistent mood benefit. Yeah. And then if that's achieved, then we still have then an, a maintenance phase with esketamine that we have them come back once a week beyond that for ongoing treatment to give them a boost. And then we start to space it out as the brain becomes more efficient in how it uses neurotransmitters at the prompting of drugs such as esketamine, then the hope is we, we wean away from it. 
that makes so much sense to me because I have just been reading so much about how we really do understand the brain is more plastic than we believe. It has more ability to change. It has more ability to create pathways that we didn't know about before. And both psilocybin and ketamine are named as those potential openers, right? And so if you do that repeatedly right, right. over a period of time, it's almost like going to the gym and building your muscle. Your brain goes, oh, I'm actually going to make that pathway yep. work. Wow. That's super interesting. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Muscle uh, memory. Yep. Yeah. Exactly right. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the new antidepressant that has also just come on the market. And this one is called Avuliti. Avuliti? Is that how you say Avelity. it? Avelity. Avelity. The first and only rapid acting oral medicine that's approved for the treatment of MDD. So Ovality, we think, again, it hasn't hit the market to where we're actually using it in practice. It's expected to come out in the next two months. But the theory behind it and, and the studies to date, it's using, believe it or not, dextromethorphan, which is commonly found in cough medicine. It's an active ingredient to most cough medicines. It's using that compound as the base to then affect the NMDA receptor that we just talked about with esketamine, but in an oral pill formulation. Wow. And so I think about mm -hmm. cough medicine and I immediately want to go to sleep. How do they prevent you from getting super tired on it? Well, that's where they also have, they've combined it with bupropion, which is also known as Wellbutrin. Okay. Um, and that is a kind of combination pill that is thought to then kind of boost the energy and activating system, if you will, uh, to prevent that from happening. Oh my gosh. There's so much exciting stuff right now happening. I mean, I, I can imagine all of our uh, patients, clients, customers, listeners who have struggled with treatment resistant depression. And not only can you bring them active recovery TMS treatments, but you can augment uh -huh. with this other stuff. So is that the goal Absolutely. for you is to augment? Why is that so important? Yeah, we're always looking for, and I harp on this term, synergy. We want anything that's going to add to our patient's ability to not only recover from depression or anxiety or whatever, but to maintain that functionality. We want them to maintain and become resilient in this. And, and that often takes a couple of different modalities where we want medicines that are novel and, and help our patients. We want talk therapy that works and allows them to process and talk through things. And then we want neuromodulation like transcranial magnetic stimulation to boost them and use the other two elements to take them to a higher place. And we want physical activity to maintain and, and prevent relapse. So all of this together, we're talking about lifestyle modification. That's why I call it therapeutic lifestyle change, TLC, as part of the treatment for depression. It's not one thing. It's not sometimes two things. Sometimes it's three and four things that need to be happening together to build the brain. And I, while I have you, I think it's so important to talk more about that therapeutic piece, because even if you're doing all this other stuff that's directed at the brain, if you're still not safe, if you're under toxic stress 24 hours a day, if you're not sleeping well, if you're not eating well, all these other modalities are not going to be very helpful, correct? Absolutely. In fact, one prime example of that is I have a patient undergoing TMS right now who, this is her second round of TMS, but she said, you know, I have to be honest with you. The last time I did TMS, even though it helped, I was drinking way too much. Huh. And she came clean about that. And it's like, look, making the decision to be clean and sober completely. We know alcohol can be a depressant. Yeah. She said, look, I, I've got to make that lifestyle modification for myself so that I'm not encumbering my own brain with this sandbag, yeah. this, this kind of sandbag that's keeping me back from mm -hmm. achieving everything I can. 
And so she's making that and is blossoming like twice as well as she did before. So it is, it's a whole package deal and it's a lifestyle modification that we look at. We just don't look at TMS. We don't look at medications. We don't look at talk therapy and isolation. We go, what is the right mix? And what are the lifestyle things that we need to modify to get you the outcome you're looking for? Dr. Raj, I have this great image of you, you know, 10 years ago, walking in with like a little pill, like a little toolbox, and then comes along TMS, and now comes along all of these other things. And it's like you have this enormous truck driving up with <laughs> all of these ways that you can yeah. help people. It must be incredibly exciting for you. Oh, I mean, that's why I'm a psychiatrist too, Sheila. I love being an internist as well, but being a psychiatrist, this is where the advancements are going to come. This is the Star Trek stuff. Yeah, I, I think honestly, in terms of your expansion and in terms of how well active recovery is doing is in part because you do offer such a full gamut. I mean, other psychiatrists are still very stuck in, I'm going to use an SSRI and that's all I got, right? And so it's nice that you bring Absolutely. this very open idea about how others can heal. We have to, Sheila, because, and we have to be as thought leaders open to change, right? If we get just stuck in, in, in medication therapy that's worked, and, and it has. So, so we don't want to poo poo pharmacotherapy medications that have worked since in Prozac's case since 1986. So we don't want to poo poo that. But at the same time, if there are novel, innovative additions or complementary medications to augment those older strategies, that's what we need. That's fantastic. And are you still planning on expanding into the Seattle area? Yeah. In fact, we got our dates. We should be there by December 15 uh, with our first clinic opening up in Kirkland, Bellevue area. That is so fantastic. So I always tell friends, like, if you are struggling, especially if you're struggling with depression, please call Active Recovery TMS because there's one, there's one in a neighborhood near you, which I think is super important. And B, you do have this kind of openness towards depression as this kind of multifaceted thing that needs to be treated with multidimensional solutions. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head of what we stand for. And you're still really asking people to consider to stay on SSRIs, whatever it is that they've been on when they come for treatment, correct? Absolutely. Because again, we're looking to, even if it's, so, so if a medication essentially is causing harm, we probably don't want to continue that medicine. Right. But even if there's a five or 10% added benefit to the medication, we can take that and with neuromodulation from TMS, it's additive. So you get improvement through the synergistic effects of both of them together. Right. Oh, well, it's always such a great pleasure to catch up with you. Thanks again for joining me today, Dr. Raj. Great. Appreciate it very much. All right. Thanks, okay. Sheila. All the Take best. Have care. a great All day. All right. Day.